A set of explicit documents have, of late, come into my private possession, which offer a revealing insight into the double life and death of the celebrated social reformer and liberal politician, the late lamented Sir Mortimer de Arthur. These scandalous first-hand accounts were transcribed from the oral testimony of, amongst others, a set of rough working lads by employees at Ambiel and Chasers of Lincoln's Inn, solicitors for the prosecution in a proposed legal action at the request of his estranged wife Amelia, that had been intended to be actioned early in 1894, but was abandoned after de Arthur's unexpected and untimely death, and were, consequently, never revealed in a public arena. How, then, the file came into my possession, all tied up with a pretty pink bow, will need remain a mystery. Suffice to say, having been identified as an interested party, I was forced to pay a pretty penny to secure said documentation. Whilst my old cohort, de Arthur, is largely remembered as much for the mysterious circumstances surrounding his inexplicable death at the relatively young age of fifty-five, as for his philanthropy, these statements portray, in lurid detail, his private doings and desires. Sordid descriptions of de Arthur's bedroom proclivities are expanded upon at length in the giant wad of handwritten documents. The 243 pages of statements from 76 witnesses have never before seen the light of day and with every good reason. Among the more shocking details are those revealed by Arnold Corns, a bellboy at the Savaloy Hotel, a favourite rendezvous for de Arthur and his band of young male companions. Describing a lengthy visit to the hotel by de Arthur, Corns recounted how he had observed many debauched activities taking place within Sir Mortimer's rented rooms on the occasion when he had tripped and fallen with his eye against the keyhole. Activities which he had then elaborated on at length to the scribe. The statements also illustrate to Arthur's reckless attitude to discovery, but without such indiscretion we may never have known the true nature of his demise and death. And so I shall turn to the last document in the folder. It is a document stamped Case Closed, and is at variance with the others. It is the sworn testimony of one such East End ruffian who tells the fateful events leading up to and including the night of 15th of December, 1893, when de Arthur had lured said ruffian to his weekend hideaway in Greenwich with the promise of full employment. Someone had helpfully written a description of the interviewee in the top margin. It read, <clears throat> Peter Wilberforce Probyn, apprentice to a builder from Shoreditch, approximately twenty-five years of age, five feet eight or nine inches tall, solidly built and handsome, with a thick mop of black hair and an impressive moustache, presents himself as honest and well-mannered for his class, cooperative and deferential. I first met Mort, as he bade me call him, on a visit to the Grime Street bathhouse, where it was my habit to go every Saturday evening, week in, week out, for a good old tuppenny scrub down and clean up, and to wash my clothes. I don't recall having seen him there before, but we fell into pleasant conversation when he commented favourably on the length and thickness of my moustache, and asked me if I would like to join him for a lap around the pool. I had no idea he was moneyed then, as he was without clothes, see, and he spoke to me like a regular bloke. Well, after our dip, he said he'd like to buy me a pint, and never one to turn down free beer. I agreed. It was only once we had dressed that I realised he was a gentleman, and I wondered if I'd done right, as we'd surely make an odd couple in any bar with his fine clothes and my threadbare attire. Still, he had a cab waiting, which saved me embarrassment, and was itself an unaccustomed treat, and he took me to this pub in Covent Garden, the middle wicket. 
Hidden away it was, well off the beaten track in a courtyard down a back alley. An odd place it was too. All the women looked like men, and most men looked like women. But Mort was generosity itself, and truth is, after fifteen pints, I couldn't have told Arthur from Martha either way. He was good company, was Mort, and seemed to take a real shine to me and an interest in life in the East End. He listened, open-mouthed, when I told him, as how I had to share my bed with four other brothers, all as big and strapping as me, and enthused when I spoke of my prowess at bare-knuckle boxing. He warned me to wear a gum shield. Take care of your teeth, he said. You have a lovely smile, he said. It struck me as an odd thing to say even at the time. I mean, one man to another, and I was proper poked up by his attentions, I was. But flattered too, if truth be told. I was also well in my cups, and I began to wonder as how I'd get home. But Mort said he'd drop me off there, and was as good as his word. And he gave me his card before taking his leave, and told me he might have need of a man such as myself in the future. Now, it being a hard winter, building work was thin on the ground, and it got me started to thinking if this need Mort had for me might involve payment. I pride myself I can turn my hand to most things. I'm handy like that. And at any rate, I was keen to profit from our acquaintance if the opportunity presented itself. The address on the card was for an apartment at 21B Cleveland Street, and by midweek I had resolved to journey there and was fortunate to find him at home. He seemed delighted to see me when his butler showed me in, and, clasping me by the shoulders, kissed me on both cheeks as they do in France, mon ami, he said with a wink. The nature of his need soon became clear when he explained he had recently bought a house in Greenwich, which was perfect for his weekend entertainment, but in something of a state of disrepair and needing renovation, and would I be at all interested? I all but kissed his hand, and it was swiftly arranged for me to accompany him to inspect the very property that following Friday afternoon. He came with his cab to collect me, my bag of tools and whatever else I had to hand, and by three o'clock we were on our way the four and a half miles to Greenwich. By half past three the sky had grown very dark indeed, and with it Mort appeared to become increasingly nerved as we drew ever closer to our destination. He told me it was the first night he would reside in the property, and admitted he was glad of my brawny company, as it was rumoured the house was haunted, but that he felt sure that I was more than a match for any spooks that might appear. He said it like a joke, but I could smell the fear come off him like you sometimes do in the ring. I asked him what he meant by rumoured, and he admitted that though it was a fine house, he'd got it at a bargain price, due to its grim reputation. The previous owner, a judge, having bludgeoned his wife and six children to death in a fit of madness, had then hung himself on the bell pull in the library. At six o'clock, the housekeeper, Mrs. Grimsdale, who had made up our rooms and evening meal, left us. She wouldn't stay on the property after six, she said. And so, with the cabby ensconced in the coach house, Mort and I were left to our own devices. We made a cursory tour of the inside of the building. It appeared watertight and fundamentally sound, but would clearly benefit from the attention of a skilled tradesman such as what I am, and promised to keep me fully occupied all winter long. The storm that had been brewing all day broke around 8.30pm that evening, as Mort and I sat together in the kitchen, drinking ale and playing cards and shove half penny. Mort seemed distracted, and not just by the rolling thunder and lightning, nor the rain lashing the windows. He kept looking at me queerly, but said not a word of what was on his mind. We indulged in a spot of arm wrestling, though he was no match for me, but he didn't seem to mind. He said the exertion would help him sleep, and he did have a fine strong grip on him. 
I was three sheets to the wind by the time it came to go to bed. Mort, ever the gentleman, helped me stagger upstairs out of my clothes into one of his night shirts and into bed. Luxury. I just lay there. I could hardly believe my good fortune. The bedroom was bigger than the two rooms I share with my entire family. And finally, I got to experience a bed all to myself. And such a bed. There never was a more comfortable one in the old world, I thought to myself. I then fell blissfully to sleep to the sound of rain still thrashing against the window panes. Mort came into my bedroom and woke me up in the early hours. He appeared to be in a much agitated state. His eyes were, were wild and wide. His hair, such as he had, was standing on end and his skin was a ghostly pallor. The candlestick he held was trembling in his hand. So I took it off him and put it on the nightstand next to me bed for fear he might drop it and set the place alight. Then he asked if I'd heard them. And when I said... Heard what? He fell to his knees upon the instant and cried, Them! Them! The woman screaming and the children crying and the thud, thud, thud and crack, crack, crack of skulls being broken. The way he went on, it proper put the wind up me, it did. I tried to reassure him, but he weren't having any of it. And that's when he asked if he might get into bed with me. Well, not so much as an ask as begging and pleading whilst clinging to me lower half. I wasn't best pleased, having finally got a bed to my own self, and him being a grown man who should have known better. But, as I was dependent on his continued good favour, I agreed. And he climbed in the bed and settled down alongside me. He was asleep and snoring within minutes. But I didn't drop off for ages. What with his hands wandering in his sleep and me having to pin them down ever so often but eventually i did nod off and that's when it must have happened i woke up around eight when mrs grimsdale knocked on the bedroom door to announce breakfast was ready woke to find myself alone in the bed though somehow it didn't i feel lumpy and it was then i realized i must have rolled over in the night rolled over on top of Mort and suffocated him. I'll never forget the look on his blackened face as I raised myself up and looked down upon him. Hideous it was. Hideous. The protruding eyes and tongue, the mouth yawning wide as if to silently scream, Get off me! But too late. Too late. The doctor who attended the death that morning was a friend of the deceased who suggested it would be better all round if I made myself scarce and that said death could then be ascribed to reasons unknown. And there the matter would have rested if the housekeeper had not seen fit to profit by informing you of my existence. But I hereby attest that it was death by misadventure, and not murder. I am an innocent party, having had everything to gain and nothing to lose from the continued good health of that fine, upstanding gentleman. I was innocent then, and I remain innocent to this day. And here Peter Wilberforce Probyn signed his testimony with an X, before fading back into obscurity.